Welcome back to another episode of Decoded. My name is Jesse and I'm the writer, director, and narrator for the Lost Codex episodes, and we are back with episode 36 of Decoded. Um, and again, every week I'm always amazed by that number. It goes up once, once a, once a week, and I'm still amazed. Um, but we are here today to talk about something very important and uh, a little bit, a little bit questionable. But we'll get to that in a moment because I want to talk about news and announcements first. Then I will have a warning for the podcast. And so, if you're here to listen to the whole podcast, I encourage you listen to the beginning so we can we can get the warning out of the way. But let's start with uh, news and announcements first, guys. Battle for Dazar Allure uh, went live this week. And uh, how are you guys enjoying it? I haven't physically been in it. I've been watching quite a few streams, actually over the last, I want to say, 48, 36 hours. I've been watching quite a few streams of just people running through it. Uh, and I see praise for it everywhere. And considering how the community, not the community, how the narrative has been over the last couple of months of just absolute hate, it's, it's good to see an overwhelming amount of praise for this raid. Um, one of the comments I saw that this is one of the funnest raids since ICC and people genuinely seem interested and they find even the trash, like there's not too much trash, they find the, the encounters between the bosses, they find the bosses engaging, apparently Mechatork is fun as hell. Um, I, I haven't done it yet, but I've been watching and it actually looks, it looks really fun. Uh, so if you haven't been been in there next week, the LFR wing will be happening. Uh, LFR wing one, and the mythic race starts, which is really cool. Uh, those are always exciting to see who's going to take home the crown for that. So the race begins next week, and for all of you people who don't have uh, a raid group, LFR wing one starts. So uh, head on, head on in there and uh, do your do your duties in the b battle for Dazar lore. Uh, there's two cinematics in this raid, uh, one for Horde, one for Alliance. And if you guys missed it, I did an analysis on each one, uh, which is up on our, our YouTube channel, and I dive into the importance of every shot, the, the music behind it, the excitement. And I was a little bit nervous with that with that analysis, because it was very rambly. It was, it was 42 minutes uh, for one and 38 minutes for the other. Um, but I went into I went into detail, and I actually I'm actually kind of happy how it turned out. So you guys go watch it. Let me know what you think. Um, and of course, all the editing and all the timed up shots. Uh, shout out to Jeff for that as well, um, because that involves a lot of a lot of nitpicky kind of honing in on certain details and zooming in and bringing in footage from other cinematics and stuff like that to compare. Uh, so that was fun to do. Uh, for those of you who missed it, uh, two days ago, what day are we? It was Saturday, so two days ago was the Q&A, uh, and it went, it went well. Uh, a lot of good information, I'm not going to cover all of it, you can go to WoW, you can go to Demo Champion, you can find all the stuff there, but just some stuff that stuck out to me. Uh, the topic of the Alliance getting the level 400 item piece, that's hot this week. Uh, and Blizzard admits that having a 400 item level reward for Alliance for War Mode at the launch of a new raid was was bad. Like they, they flat out say that was that shouldn't have happened. You know, having a 370 piece for a Rathi uh, three weeks into Uldir, that's not a big deal. At the launch of Battle for Desire Lore, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, so if it's back next week, they're not sure, uh, it will be scaled down to 385 or so they say. Um, something I found interesting is that the war mode bonus is determined by the amount of players participating on the outnumbered faction. Um, apparently it's an auto an auto adjust feature uh, and they believe it might drop to 25 next week uh, in increments of five so it goes up by five it drops by five maximum of 30 percent so when it's more balanced but it's slightly more in the alliance's favor maybe the horde will have a 15 percent bonus or something like that so um, the sharding of realms and the lag of realms with these uh, war mode, uh, issues is the number one priority Blizzard acknowledges that they have not fixed it and they are doing everything in their power to fix it because how can you enjoy their game if you can't even cast spells and Ian even made a note that he'll log on one night to do uh, some quests and he'll just suddenly find that the lag is overwhelming um, so if you guys are going to put in reports about lag and I did it the other day while doing dungeons the best thing you can do is put in a bug report give them all information where are you uh, are you in a dungeon what time it is server time um, or time zone wind is if you don't know what your server time is do time zone what character you're on what realm you're on and what happened so we were in a dungeon uh, what dungeon were we in I think I was in um... oh I was doing the 
was it a war mode I was doing? I don't know. I was doing something and I stopped what I was doing, put in the bug report, put in the time zone, uh, and I basically just wrote, my, my spells aren't casting. I'm casting instant spells and I'm standing there doing nothing. Um, give them as much information so that they can go and look what was going on on that realm, on that shard at that time to determine, uh, and hopefully they can come to a solution for this fast. Um, they gave some interesting information on the on the Kaltiris humans and the Zandalari. Uh, again, those were coming in 8.1.5. They are not coming out for the raid. And what I found interesting was that they mentioned the uh, Kaltiris humans were never 100% certain as an allied race. Uh, Zandalari was from the beginning, which is why they showed Zandalari and Dark Irons at BlizzCon. Uh, but they were never sure if they could do the Kaltiris humans. And um, unlike everything else, which is a using an existing skeleton, including the Zandalari. The Zandalari is literally the Dark Spear model rigged upright. Um, a lot of people think it's a copy and paste of Night Elves. It's not, it's actually the Dark Spear. Keep in mind, when the Warlords uh, revamp went in for all the models, they implemented a system that allowed them to take animations and spread it across different skeletons, which is why the Sethrak have a female Worgen walk but a uh, female Pendar in attack form. They're able to take animations from different races and apply them to different skeletons, which is why there are certain animations Zandalari share with Night Elves, but their actual skeleton, the actual rig itself, is a Darkspear model moved upright. Um, as said by Shaney Edwards in my 2017 BlizzCon interview, and Kaltiris humans are the exception. They are 100% a brand new rig, new skeleton. People, I keep people seeing people say that they share a skeleton with Draenite. That is not true. Um, they 100% new, and they weren't certain if it was gonna if they were gonna be able to do it because the whole point of allied races is to be able to churn out multiple versions of them because they they reuse assets, right? And we essentially got a new race with the Kaltiris humans in, in terms of their, their rigs and skeletons, which is kind of cool. Uh, the Zandalari were supposed to be out with Dark Irons in 8.0, but when they decided to do the Kaltiris humans, they decided they should make sense. And I always thought Zandalari launching at 8.0 was kind of weird, because the, we, the whole point of going to Zandalari is to earn their trust, right? Why would they be unlocked at the end? You could argue, you know, you have to complete the end of the, end of the story, 8.0 storyline to unlock them, but... I think having them unlock after the battle for Desara lore makes a little bit more sense, given the events that happen in there. Um, and then the last thing that I thought was really cool they announced in the Q&A was uh, Shoe Boots from Merely a Setback Podcast, uh, who's in the Lost Codex Discord community, um, asked if, if all 50 character slots could be applied to one realm, as opposed to having a limit per realm, but only having 50 on your account. And surprisingly, Ian just kind of out of the blue just said, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we, we could probably do it. Probably. Why not? It was a very it was a very sudden answer to the point where even Josh looked at him and was like, Oh, alright. Uh, so, not 100% confirmed, but Ian says he doesn't see a problem as to why the 50 character per server can't just be applied to the realms as well. So you'll have your... If you have, if you have 50 character slots on your account, if you want to make all 50 on one, on one server, go for it. Which is kind of cool. Um... The last thing I want to announce, uh, or before, now, now let's let's launch into Lost Codex announcements, uh, because I usually say those for the end of the podcast, but given the nature of the podcast today, uh, I don't want to have to tell people, well, if you don't want to listen to it, leave, but come back for the end. So we'll get everything out of the way now. Um, for those of you who are on Patreon, I've been posting the updates for the new upcoming uh, Loa video that we're working on. That is in production soon. The animation stage uh, is beginning very shortly, so we will have a new video out very soon. Uh, working with a couple of artists, uh, one of which is in our Discord, Sir Tompshire. Uh, I believe Issei Silva is also working on a piece, and Hypnos, Hip from Hypnos World, also collaborated with us as well on this Loa episode. So keep a, keep an eye out for uh, future announcements on, on what the topic is. Um, and uh, if you want some behind the scenes, you know, access or, or look at to what's happening check out uh, patreon.com slash lost codex where we post uh, the director's call so I did a director's call with Jeff where him and I read through the script and I give all my ideas and suggestions for screen directions and he chimes in with well how about we do this and I say that sounds a lot better let's do that uh, and then behind the scenes images and a breakdown of the script and stuff like that so 
Moving on to the big thing that we're doing for February. Uh, this started off as a little pet project of Jeff's, to which then we kind of absorbed together as the Lost Codex. And for those of you listening on audio for iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, stuff like that, this next bit, there's going to be a, like a little 30 second visual. Um, keep an eye out on Twitter. We're going to post this video very soon. But um, to those of you watching live on Twitch right now or the YouTube version, you're going to see something come up in a second. And, well, I always thought that the, 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 the art prompts that people did were really cool. Um, and I always liked following those, following those tags. One of the most recent ones off of memory was uh, Dre Sember, where an uh, artist by the name of Ruru Cat did a, Ruru Cat, sorry, did a, uh, uh, an art prompt where all the days of the month you, there was a theme uh, or a sort of a, a topic and the, the theme for the month was, was Draenei. And if you couldn't do one of the prompts, that's okay. It's just it's an art prompt. It was a writing prompt. It was a any any kind of prompt you want to do. And uh, so we want to do one. Uh, and given all the exciting lore that's coming, both in 8.2 and the Battle for Desire lore, I am happy to announce that we are doing Gnomebrary. And here is our little our little announcement video for that. Any second now. Give it a moment. We got a problem. Uh, Chrome crashed. Why am I using Chrome? Ah, we got it. Production, we got it. There we go. So that is uh, Gnomebrary. Uh, we are celebrating a a month of gnome appreciation because of all the all the new and exciting stuff that's coming with Battle for Desire lore and Mechagon and everything. Uh, this is this was a a, a Jeff prompt. He he said I'm thinking about doing something called Gnomebrary. And I said all right, go on. And he said well you know there's a lot of art art prompts out there. For different months, and I thought, well, let's do it. Let's do a gnome one. And I thought, this is the month. Technically, January would be the month, but we're halfway over through January. Why not February? Uh, and with Mechagon coming, the shortest month. There's another pun. Um, Gelbin Mechatork being one of the bosses in in uh, Battle for Desire lore. And you know, a little bit of a side note here. Gnomes are are memed. Gnomes are uh, laughed at. But really, gnomish technology is one of the most superior aspects of the Alliance. Uh, if you guys haven't read Chronicle uh, 3, Chronicle 3, uh, where they cover the events of the fall of Nomergon and all that, Gelbin Mechatork is one of the biggest heroes of the Alliance. Go read, we're gonna do a Gnome lore video one day, and uh, we're gonna do a Gnome Appreciation podcast, and go read, go read Chronicle 3, because Chronicle Three. We have a full prompt uh, that we'll be announce. We'll be throwing up on uh, Twitter later today on uh, the Saturday, January twenty sixth, and we'll be putting up uh, just an art prompt of, of different ideas, different themes that we want to do. Um, and this started off as, as as a Jeff collaboration project, but I I dove right in, and uh, Jeff and I we we kind of hashed out a prompt list and we have things like you know introduce your character uh, day two is family day three is tinkering day four is no Morgan's fall and if, if you can't if you can't draw if you can't paint if you can't um, make machinima art we also want to encourage that this is also for machinima artists as well if you want to make you know still images or whatever or even just screenshots in game with a little written blurb um, 
this is for you. And if you can't do any of that, write a short story, write a poem, write write something, write a little little poem or a little diary entry in Twitter format. You have 250 characters, do a prompt every day, uh, the, the, the diary of a gnome in, in 250 characters or less. Um, sketches, anything you want. So we're excited. We've got a whole bunch of uh, visuals for this as well, for the, the launch of Gnomebrary. And actually, um, there's a Zandlarary, Zandlarary, Zand, I, I have to look at the word, happening as well. Uh, and I reached out to the artist behind that because I thought, this is so fitting. There's a Zandlarary February and a Gnome February. And the splash art for Battle for Bizarre Lore is Mechatork versus Rastakhan, which is amazing. It was meant to be the stars aligned, so gnomes, get ready. Um, because the best race of the Alliance is coming to you this February. And uh, yeah, let's start with the podcast. Now, here's 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 my warning. Now, this podcast is not for everyone. Um, this, is, this is a darker podcast. We're going to be talking about the, the horrors and the war crimes that happen in on screen in, in, in WoW but also off screen. And I know that when the beta was live and all of the Teldrassil stuff was coming out and Brennadam Square and, and Stormsong was coming out, a lot of people were put off. A lot of people were like, whoa, this is way too dark for my Warcraft. And I, I kind of disagree with that because this is Warcraft, right? This is, it's a, it's a high fantasy world, but there are horrible things that happen in this world. And do they all need to be shown or explicitly written in gory, horrifying details? No. But that doesn't mean they don't happen. Um, so I'm, the warning I'm giving you here is if, if the topic of Brennadam Square or the horrors of Teldrassil, the war crimes, the the assumptions that we can make, if we look at, if we look at A, history, and B, uh, fantasies like Game of Thrones, there are a lot of parallels that we can draw to the off-screen suggestions that happen here. And this is, uh, I, I actually, shout out to uh, Light is my co-pilot uh, on the Discord. Her and I were talking about this the other day in, in Discord, uh, in the voice chat late one night. And it actually sparked a whole idea for, for, a, for, a, for a conversation, for a topic. Um, and so... Battle for Azeroth really focuses on this, but there's a couple of scenes. I don't even want to focus much on the Battle for Azeroth horrors. I want to talk about some of the other stuff. Um, so, if the gruesome, gory details of history and Game of Thrones bothers you in any kind of way, um, don't don't keep listening because I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about some really dark themes. Um, and I'm not going to try and justify, I'm not going to try and encourage it, but it's there. It happens in the world, right? This is not a, this is not a Disneyland fantasy world. Um, so here's your warning. If you're going to opt out, if, you, if, you, if this just seems like, ah, you know what, a little bit too much for me, I get it. I totally understand. There are certain elements to World of Warcraft. It is a fantasy, teen-rated game. I don't need to see all this gore and all this questionable actions. Why do I have to play the villain faction? This is going to bother you. I totally get it. No judgment. Stop listening now. We'll see you for episode 37. Uh, for those of you who are staying, let's let's dive into it. Now, the war grime... The war grimes. The, the war crimes in games. Um, they're not always shown in the game, but they're often implied. And before Warlords of Draenor, the two things that stood out in my mind were, this, were Shatrath, the Siege of Shatrath in the original timeline, and the Sacking of Stormwind. Both are done by the Horde's heads. Orcs. Uh, and this is going to say, people are, at the end of this podcast, people are going to say, Jesse just talked about the Horde the whole podcast. I'm sorry, but there's a lot of Horde stuff to talk about. I do talk about a lot of, a little bit of Alliance, question, questionable actions. Um, and then I talk about, obviously, the villains who do some horrifying things as well. Uh, but we're starting off with... The, the sacking of Shatrath and the sacking of Stormwind, there was, you know, it wasn't just a, oh, set the city on fire and laugh as peasants run around. No, there was the brutal slaughter of, of Draenei, you know, men, women, and children. Uh, I think there's depiction in Rise of the Horde where they are throwing Draenei off of the Aldor Rise uh, for them to splatter to their death. Stormwind, the sacking of Stormwinds, um, so many people died in there, and you had these, you had these blood-crazed orcs you know, rampaging through 
Sure, Orgrim Doomhammer wasn't a complete asshole, but these orcs were, uh... It wasn't, it wasn't a Disneyland time for Stormwind. And, but this has all been off-screen, and we saw the sacking of Shatrath happen in Warlords, uh, but a lot of it was, there was a lot of Fell, there was a lot of Shadow Council, uh, there were the Iron Horde as well, but it almost becomes when the, sh when the Burning Legion gets involved, it suddenly becomes, oh, it's no longer mortals doing it, it's this upper evil twisted demons, and that's more expect- not that it's okay, but when you see Felguards torturing civilians, you're like, you are evil, but when you see mortal races torturing civilians, then it becomes a, oh, I can suddenly relate to this on a much more personal level. Um, either way, a lot of it is shown off screen. Now, Battle for Azeroth is a little bit different, specifically, um, and I'm talking both the in game and the out of game writing as well. So, uh, Teldrassil, we've got Teldrassil and uh, the short story of uh, Elegy, or Elegy, however you pronounce it, whatever. Um, and if you haven't read the short story, The Alliance Prelude, go read it. Um, it's it's awful to read. And I, when I say awful, I don't mean bad writing. Christy Golden blew it out of the park. But it's heart-wrenching. Um, very quick summary. Uh, the base of Teldrassil, there's that little village, the little, the little port. That's the first spot the fire hits. And there were hundreds of civilians on that little port at the base of Teldrassil trying to get through the portal to get to the top of the tree to get to safety. So imagine this mass rush of people just trying to elbow each other and push through and suddenly liquid napalm starts landing on them. The whole island, the whole base of the tree went up in flames in seconds. All civilians, no soldiers, all civilians. The tree caught fire like no tomorrow. Furbog villages and all the other villages, people running from the starting zone. Picture where the starting zone is for Night Elves. And there was a shot, there was a, a part where it mentions Night Elf civilians running towards Darnassus for safety and the fires just overtaking them and consuming them as this, this liquid napalm just rushed over them. Um, the, 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 the cities of, of, uh, of Darnassus and these, these massive buildings uh, being crushed by the, the upper trees uh, of Teldrassil that caught on fire and then collapsed. There's a part where a bunch of, a bunch of civilians take shelter in the waters of, of the, the Temple of Elun, and then the statue falls on those civilians and it talks about how the waters turned blood red as these civilians were crushed. It is horrifyingly detailed and sad as you as they describe night elf children and night elf civilians passing out from the smoke and and just and just dying in their sleep um really really horrible thing and, and this was kind of a oh my god this is you know this is not something new to warcraft but it is something that's new to warcraft right that's always existed but now it's right in our face uh the other example is brunadam village when the horde attack a um uh, one of the large towns in Stormsong, you see civilian outposts on fire, you see farmers impaled on pikes into the wall, you see children crying. That, that We don't see that very often in-game at the hands of an enemy faction, or of a, of a player faction, rather. Horde players didn't do this, but it was still the Horde who did this. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty rough. And I will say that maybe this isn't all something that needs to be shown. What what's shown in game, you know, it, it's 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 towing the line. And some I saw many people on Twitter outraged that they would sh that the horde would be shown in such brutality. And I'm sitting there going, history says otherwise. But whatever. Um, but it could be a lot worse. And my the point I really want to sell here is that something it, it doesn't need to be shown but it's still part of the story. Just because it doesn't happen on screen doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Now I want to talk about Game of Thrones for a very brief second, and um, Game of Thrones is obviously, we know there's a lot of extreme violence, a lot of extreme gore, and a lot of extreme adult themes like rape. And there's a lot of people who don't either read the books or watch the TV shows, and I remember there was a particular, I'm, I'm gonna do no spoilers, there's a particular character in one of the later seasons who was raped, that wasn't raped in the books. And this sparked an outrage. And I remember George R. Martin's comment sticking out to me uh, about how, although he does write fantasy, 
It is it is a fantasy based on history, right? Oh, you put dragons in it, you can make it a, a society that's different. And he says, well, you know, he's reflecting on a story that's part of the Middle Ages. And I, I'm not defending George R. R. Martin anyway, and I'm not saying it's a part of the story, but Middle Ages were not a sexually equal time. Uh, there was a lot of strong ideas about the roles of women, and what George puts in the books reflects the barriers women faced back then and even now today, and the fears women have. And the one line stuck out to me that says, if you're going to write about a war, and you, just want, you just want to include all the cool battles and heroes killing lots of orcs and something like that, and you don't portray sexual violence, then there's something fundamentally dishonest about that. Rape, unfortunately, is still a part of war today. It's not the strongest testament to the human race, but I don't think we should pretend it doesn't exist. Now, topics like that have no place in a team team related game, like outright. There was, for those of you who don't know in Warlords, there was heavy suggestion in Alpha, correct me if I'm wrong, where Maraud is is freaking out because Yorel's been captured and there is there was some heavy suggestion that she was captured and that rape was involved. It was dark for the for the warlords alpha and and again we don't see we don't see rape used a lot in the Warcraft universe in any way but there's suggestions of it in many places specifically with the first horde the orcish horde and then we see after the half uh have a half draenei half orcs um and uh, specifically in Wrath of Lich King 2, or even in Cataclysm with, with dragons and stuff like that. We, there's actually rape charges thrown against Garrosh, or Garrosh's horde rather, in war crimes about with uh, Alex Straza being uh, for forced pregnancy. Some of these themes are a little bit dark and necessarily don't have a place within a team team related game. And I completely agree with that. You know, World of Warcraft has a large audience and throwing in these adult themes is a little bit a little bit much for, especially for teenagers to handle. Um, but the point that I wanted to get to was was George's comment about it being fundamentally dishonest uh, about history, and I think that's what's important in terms of today's topic on the podcast, talking about the extreme violence and the war crimes that happen in game. We're not we're not going to talk about uh, the 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 rape accounts and rape events in World of Warcraft because that is that is a very very dark theme, darker than we're already going, but. The horrifying war crimes, to not show them, to to not portray them or not even mention them, is 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 a dishonest uh, view on the story. And this story, you know, George makes a comment that he views a lot of these fantasy worlds as Disneyland fantasies with the heroes and the princesses and the evil villains with mustaches. Um, I resent that statement as someone with a mustache, and. I don't think Azeroth needs to fall into that category. I think it's fundamentally dishonest to to not have these horrible, barbaric things happen at the hands of normal people. Um, the nature of the nature of humans in a war setting, and we're going to talk about that later. Uh, but there's some examples that I want to kind of open people's eyes on, and everything I'm about to tell you in terms of these war crimes, they are what ifs. They are they may have happened. This is not Blizzard confirming in any way, but if you're going to look at Azeroth in a realistic perspective, not the in-game scale, but on the global worldwide scale that it is, that Goldshire takes five days to get from Goldshire to Stormwind, that you've got hundreds of thousands of people in one population, you've got the worst possible people of the Horde and the best possible people of the Horde, same with the Alliance, then you cannot deny that these things may have happened uh, in actuality. Um, so we'll start with, and, and f to, to reiterate, um, my goal isn't to convince you that we, the players, or our factions are the bad guys, um, or one faction is more evil or twisted than the other. My goal is to just sort of bring a spotlight to the fact that while we are the heroes of the story, not everyone in our faction is a hero of the story. Um, and let's dive right in. Warlords of Draenor is the first topic I want to talk about. Now, people often say that they want revenge on Grom and the Iron Horde because the ending was left dissatisfied. And I'll just say the stepping stones for Redemption Arc were there. Gul'dan throwing Gorhowl at Grom's feet, 
Grom coming to the realization. Grom being held prisoner uh, in the in the Tenan jungle trailer. Um, and then Draenor is free. There was those are three big stepping stones, but the in between Grom being held prisoner and Draenor is free was gameplay. That Grom story was never explored. So uh, it's my personal headcanon conspiracy theory. You know, the cinematics team provided three different cinematics, lead two different cinematics, and then Grom's redemption. Draenor is free cinematic. My theory is that the game team somewhere in there failed to make that transition which is why a lot of people felt dissatisfied with the end of warlords they wanted revenge same way people want to revenge on garrosh they want to revenge on grom now what did the iron horde do what happened on draenor by no means am i defending the iron horde the iron horde rampaged across draenor and attacked countless innocent outpost cities tanan jungle right away when you get to tanan jungle you see that the the dark portal is being powered by souls how are they powering up by souls they are literally shoveling in frost wolves and Draenei uh, civilians, prisoners, into these grinders that just kill them and then transfer their soul into the portal. Not exactly, you know, the, the whole dark portal originally, Gul'dan opens the dark portal by slashing the throat of a Draenei child in Rise of the Horde. People, don't, people haven't read Rise of the Horde, spoilers, the dark portal is opened by Gul'dan cutting the throat of a kid. Um, in the movie, Gul'dan uh, kills a whole bunch of Draenei all at once and opens the portal. Um, but the Iron Horde did the same thing with souls of both orcs this time and Draenei. Uh, so right away, you're introduced to, oh my god, these guys are awful. The attack on Karabor and Shatrath, the Iron Horde Blackrock attack. And you can make the assumption that the Blackrock's initial attack on Shatrath may have been similar to the original Shatrath attack that happened in the original universe. The one reason, the one difference is the orcs getting lost in their absolute demonic bloodlust, but now they have the orders to destroy this enemy city. This enemy city is a massive city, they have a fleet, they have a port, they have satellite defenses, they've got uh, ground troops, take them out. And orcs are a barbarian race, so war crimes definitely happened here, no doubt about it. Uh, Frostwolf and Laughing Skull Settlements. Uh, both both clans rejected Grom, rejected the idea of joining this Iron Horde. And you can imagine that to, to the Iron Horde, that is an insult. The Frostwolves have denied this united... Take a step back for a second. The Iron Horde was a united joining of clans. And... The original Horde uniting their clans, that was one of the best moments in Orcish history with terrible consequences. The clans had never worked together in such unison and suddenly they come together to create this Horde who then went on to do horrible things. Same with the Iron Horde. The Iron Horde is, you know, Grom's, we will never be slaves. We, we are free. We're gonna come together and make one big Orcish clan. And the Frost will say, fuck you, no. And the Laughing Skulls laugh at them and go do whatever they do. Insane things. Now the Iron Horde's like, you guys are, but you guys, that is not, that is not uh, the team spirit. And then they proceed to attack them. So Frost Wolves and Laughing Skull Settlements attacked. Uh, Shadow Moon, the Shadow Moon orcs always kind of lived in, in, in peace with the Draenei. But suddenly, Grom shows up, kicks open Ner'zhul's door, and says, I don't like you, your clan's useless, show me something, give me something to work with, or you're done. And Ner'zhul taps into the dark the dark history of, of you know, I, I was kind of dissatisfied with that plot point, I would have loved to see a good Ner'zhul, or a Ner'zhul conflicted Ner'zhul, but they just went pure villain with him. Um, and so we see the Shadow Moon capturing Draenei for, uh, for Shadow Moon sacrifices. We see the war song raiding Talar in, uh, in Nagrand. Innocence dead across the map. There is nothing good about the Iron Horde was doing in their war rampage across Draenor. Coffee break. Now, what does the Iron Horde do after? The Iron Horde, foolishly, doesn't complete their campaign on Draenor and decides let's attack Azeroth as well, which is why the Iron Horde failed. I honestly believe that the Iron Horde had conquered Draenor. They would have been a lot more difficult to face. The Iron Horde decides to invade Azeroth. They attack the Alliance and Horde outposts in Blasted Land. They set up an Upper Blackrock Spire. We come in. We, the heroes, proceed to invade Draenor, push them back, 
And then zone by zone, we sack the Iron Horde completely. We dismantle their armies, we upheave their war machines, we bring an end to the Iron Horde. Gul'dan throws it back in Grom's face. Your men died for nothing. And then Grom says, my men died with honor. It's, Shut up, Grom. No, they didn't. This was a waste. Gr Even Gul'dan's like, bruh, what is this? What did you do? This is useless. That's, Gul'dan didn't say bruh for the record, paraphrasing. Maybe he did, I have to rewatch it. Um, but who is a part of this Alliance attack force? You know, we have the heroes who died at the battle for the Dark Portal, but then Cadgar decides, oh, I can open portals across worlds and timelines, because that shouldn't be impossible, um, and brings in forces from both Orgrimmar and Stormwind, which I found to be a little bit, eh, whatever. So now we have heroes like Cadgar and Thrall and and uh, Felsong and all these all these characters come through, and we have ground troops. We have the armies of the Alliance, and we have the armies of the Horde. Now, we the hero go off and do our business. We fight alongside your realm, we do all the main stuff. Uh, but we, there are some other troops and other squads in the background. Admiral Taylor had his own garrison with his own population of civilians and soldiers in Spires of Iraq. Something happened there. We still don't know what happened there to this day. We don't know what that whole thing was. It was a cl cut plot line, but it still happened. So who, who could be in this alliance troop of, of soldiers? That's not Urel, that's not Khadgar, that's not the hero. Well, what if there's angry alliance vets who saw the Iron Horde pushing into Blasted Lands the same way Varian did? Varian freaking out over his map, Murad talking to him. That is PTSD for that dude. This is a flashback to War 1 and War 2 uh, in early Warcraft history. These orcs are the same orcs that attacked years ago, only they don't have they, they don't have green skin this time. What about Alliance who had just rampaged through the streets of Orgrimmar? We're going to talk about the Siege of Orgrimmar later. Uh, in the siege uh, of both Orgrimmar and when the Horde rampaged across Pandaria. So now we have a whole bunch of Alliance who, who Varian just said to the Horde that if they step one foot out of line, he's going to dismantle them. Now this isn't the Horde doing this, but the Alliance, their blood is heated right now. What about the Horde? Well. We could have angry horde rebels who were reminded of Garrosh's Corcoran and thugs. The loss of Darkspear lives and Torin and others from Garrosh's regime. Suddenly, this is this is churning up very recent behaviors and feelings within the newly settled people. The the the, the horde is just licking their wounds, and suddenly all these orcs come, led by Grumash Hellscream, whispered in the ear by Garrosh Hellscream. They're mad now. These are orcs who are who are just been bred to hate their enemy, twisted, their minds warped to hate the Horde, to hate the Alliance. So now we've got angry Horde who come in here. What about old orcs who fought bet who fought to better themselves in this new world? You know, old orcs like Saurfang, who look back on their history thinking, we can be better, we can do better. And then they see this Iron Horde group coming through and they're like, you dumbasses, this is not what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be better. And then we've got Forsaken and Elves who are just disgusted with anything related to orcs and Garrosh's antics. So we have a lot of angry members of the Horde and a lot of angry members of the Alliance. Now here is the what if factor, all right? The Alliance and Horde attack Nagrand. Now the Warsong lived here and there was, there was uh, the Warsong were known for raiding. They literally raided and pillaged outpost after outpost. But there was ports here, Iron Horde ports in the south. There was trading lines here. This is where Garrosh held court as chieftain of the Warsong. Grom promoted him chieftain of his own clan while Grom took up war chief. Um, the Iron Horde... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, population here wasn't massive. It was mostly Warsong. The Iron Horde were mostly located in Blackrock Foundry and Tanan, but the Warsong were still here, and there was a lot of... Warsong attacking, you know, the Draenei of Telmor. But what about the Warsong villages? What about the villages of just Warsong peons? You know, the, the men and women who aren't part of the armies. What about the Warsong children? Now, when we, the hero, go in, of, you know, hero of the Grand Alliance, slayer of Deathwing, fighter of Arthas, all this stuff, we're not going to go in and commit war crimes. But if you've got angry vets coming in or angry Darkspear coming in, and in the heat of battles, how many Warsong children or Warsong peons are cut down in this battle that happened off screen? If we look at war, if we look at Nagrand as a massive 
massive zone. Not the little where it takes two minutes to get from one side to the other, but days to go from one side to the other. You've got Warsong villages dotted all around, little Warsong children running around, uh, old Warsong uh, orcs who are doing their best to, to, to try and help in any way. They can't fight, but they can chop wood, they could wash armor, they could do something. How many of them died when the when the siege tanks came barreling through? When the when the when the dark spear and the forsaken came riding through? How many of them fell? And again, I'm not trying to pass off oh the Iron Horde are victims, but they did have their victims amongst them. Gorgrond, massive Blackrock population, not a lot of villages of Blackrock villages, but the Blackrocks had a massive population of the Foundry, and we the heroes we raid the Foundry. We go in, you know. Do, do you think we really raided a, a fortress? that towers over the land with 10 people. No, we went we went in with an army and there was different floors being attacked. Same with the siege of, of Ice Crown Citadel. 10 people didn't go in there. It was an army that went in there, uh, lore wise at least. So how many how many Blackrock civilians were, 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 who were simply just working in the forge or, or uh, too old to fight or, or again, I'm gonna keep children, unfortunately are gonna keep coming up. How many of them were cut down? What about the Shadow Moon in, in, in the villages of, of Shadow Moon Valley? Um, did, you know, the question you could ask is when the Shadow Moon exiles left near Zul, when his wife took the exiles away, did they take as many children with them? What if, what if they couldn't take all the children or the or the pregnant women or the or the old, old crippled orcs who couldn't do anything? Did they take them with them? Um, Thunderlord City, this stood out to me because the Thunderlords didn't look inherently evil. There wasn't a whole lot about them that was, you know, super cruel in a lot of way. They were pretty much Frostwolf cousins. And the Frostwolves come in with the Horde and they just sack the place. So how many, how many Thunderlords who were, you know, just profession workers or, or fishermen or weapon crafters were cut down in that process? Um, when you look at things, when the plot, when the when the villains, the villain faction, are a mortal race, suddenly it becomes a little bit more darker. You know, we the Iron Horde was cruel and evil, and they tortured Drana. Yeah, that's true. But do you think the children were also doing that? No, there there were there were innocents in there, and there were there were children in there. And sure, Yorel didn't walk in with her hammer and and smack two old orcs and a pregnant orc lady in the face. But who's to say that? You know, an orc, who, uh, a Draenei who just survived the Siege of Shatrath uh, with anger problems like Murad didn't come in and see and, and see red instantly. You know, there's nothing suggesting that happened, but if we pretend it didn't happen just because it wasn't shown, that's a little being a little bit dishonest. A um, little bit of a throwback to last week's episode, we've got the island expeditions. And I think the island expeditions are, are worth talking about because Latest brought up a point that the Nerubians settle here. Now, Nerubians are spiders, kill spiders, I get it. These are living Nerubians, and living Nerubians have never had a pro- like, they don't- they were friends with us up in Northrend, friends. So we have these Nerubians who escaped the absolute sheer horrors of the War of the Spider and, and the Scourge. The fact that these spiders thought the Scourge was horrifying should say something. Dug in these massive underground tunnels, dug up onto these islands and decided, and if you guys haven't been, there's an island, I think it's the Skittering Hollow Island, the, the giant quarry. You see Nerubian buildings there. You see Nerubian, not just like a little outpost. They have been here a while. There's eggs and there's there's probably a whole lot more underground that we don't see. And then we, the players, come in going, ooh, Azerite, and we just slaughter everything in our path. Um, again, the narrative of the game forces us to do that, but for, you know, it, there's no way for us to approach the Nerubians and let me try diplomacy. That's not the point of islands. But in essence, we just walk in and we just slaughter all those Nerubians who, you know, years ago they said, we escaped the War of the Spider, we escaped uh, Azul Nerub, we escaped Arthas. We are here in the palm trees. We, this is beautiful. And then you hear, a oh, ship oh, pulls up and all these drooling alliance and horde. Oh, that's right. And oh, fuck, here we go. And bam, they're dead. Uh, rip all the eggs. Same with um, the Hosen and the Jinyu. The Hosen are a little bit of a mixed bag. We've either fought the Hosen on Pandaria or allied with them. But the Jinyu, they, they live here in peace. And the Jinyu are actually interesting because they see us as, a, as an honorable enemy. They are after this giant scary monster that lives in the water. And they see, oh, the waves have brought us a gift. You were the gift. You can't leave. 
we will fight you in honorable combat. When they die, they say, oh, this was how it was meant to be. But the Hosen, they go from village to village, you know, eating bananas and throwing poop, whatever they do. And then we come in and set everything on fire and murder. You know, how, how many little Hosen children? How many little Jinyu tadpoles are there? Do we do we go in, you know, and, and step on those? I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a, again, these are little funny examples. Keepers of the Grove, these, these keepers of nature. They have no problem killing us because it's to preserve balance, but we upset the balance by being there looking for Azerite. They are there doing their jobs and we come in a little bit more questionable. Now, let's go back to something a little bit more darker. Let's talk about Gilneas and the poor bastards of Gilneas. Their story is full of heartbreak. As much as they're cocky and arrogant and they built that wall, we have the victims of the rebellion. So war rages across the country uh, as as the as the rebellion faction in Gilneas fight uh, with Crowley and Greymane. You can imagine that food supplies are diminished and 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 villages are are are, are put to the torch. Uh, the fields are salted, stuff like that. Uh, infighting in their own country. Then the Worgen outbreak breaks out and and. I think if you if you put yourself in the realistic mindset of Azeroth, think about how dark Gilneas is. You have werewolves running around, ripping people to shreds, um, and only passing on the curse when they successfully bite. Now, there was a plan by the Alpha Prime Worgen to pass on this this curse, but many of the Pharaoh Worgen were just going around killing innocents as well. There was people just dying in the streets, being. Uh, being ripped apart, uh, and so you have this mass evacuation of Gilneas as, as, the, as suddenly the worgen population, your neighbor is turned into a worgen and you are, for, do, you, do you shoot your neighbor, to, or now you yourself are a worgen, and you rip your neighbor's family apart, again, with no conscious mind of this, people just say, ha ha, it's English werewolves, that's fun, uh, and they're, they're swiping some guards. No, like, there are people dead, there are innocents dead. Of course, we don't see the bodies and the torn apart gore in game, but think about it. Think of any horror movie with werewolves and vampires and, and how, how, how that works. That is what happened in Gilneas. You've got a mass evacuation of Gilneas City to escape, and in that city, you have people leaving. You have people rushing, trying to escape as best as they can. And heroes stay behind, like Crowley and others, to, to try and fend off the Worgen. The population is now scattered. People are fleeing to Stormglen, people are fleeing to Duskhaven. You've got terrified children, men, women, not soldiers. I mean, you do have soldiers as well, but you've you got farmers, and you've got the old and the crippled, who are, you know, do you leave them behind? Do you help them? What's happening here? And then on cue in March the Forsaken, and here come, and by the way, the Forsaken were working with Alpha Prime. So Alpha Prime was an ally of Sylvanas. For those of you who don't know, Alpha Prime was a night elf turned worgen from a million years ago, one of Malfurion's old students, and he was working with Sylvanas. So now you've got the worgen population chasing the civilians of Gilneas to the coast, and now you have Forsaken ships showing up. And the Gilneans don't know what Forsaken are, so to them, it's Scourge. The Scourge have boats, and the Scourge have free will now. They don't know what's happening. So now the Scourge is mar marching onto the shores. The Forsaken are there with their blight guns. The people of Gilneas are trapped on, are being attacked from all sides, and just as that's all happening, the Cataclysm hits, and the ground starts shaking, and the whole coast falls into the water, and the wall cracks in half. So now you've got the, the, the scary nature of werewolves, you've got the scary nature of zombies that can think and spray blight. You've got the world rising up against you. Um, that is sheer terrifying for the Worgen. And people say, why is Gen so angry about Sylvanas? Are you joking me? We're not gonna get into that right now, but are you joking me? Gen needs to let it go. Sure, let go that, you know, over half of his population was ripped apart by Worgen or melted by Forsaken. Like, are you joking me right now? And this isn't to focus on the Horde attack, this is to focus on the Forsaken attack specifically. Uh, and then we have the Forsaken take over Gilneas City. And there's the noble effort of Greymane and Liam to reclaim the city. Liam dies. Sylvanas jumps over the hill, over the moon. 
and the blight is dropped on the city. So now we have the people who fought their way in, trying to fight their way out. Surviving children and peasants and soldiers of all kinds are now fleeing the Forsaken, fleeing uh, the Worgen and the Cataclysm itself. Gilneas was not a fun time, and the, the sheer horror that happened in Gilneas, I think, is, is not to be left understated. People just see it, you know, the horse, yeah, it was a victory, it was cool, but it's like, think about it for a second. Think about how many are dead, how many, the, the sheer psychological horror. How cool would it be would, would be to see like a machinima or, or a cinematic with that psychological horror of you're being hunted by werewolves, but you're also being hunted by zombie, crazy zombies who when they find you, they will strap you down, cut you open, and fill you with toxic blight just to see what happens. That's terrifying. And then as it's happening, an earthquake happens and it swallows you whole. Just just to add chaos to the to the horror story. Topic of Forsaken. Marching across Lordaeron through Cataclysm. The, for, the South Shore Blight. I, I can't get over how many people overlook South Shore. Sylvanas' attack on Teldrassil was unprecedented, ruining her character. She would never do something like that. Really? Really? South Shore? Does no one remember South Shore? Uh, how many how many civilians escaped? Well, a lot of them made it to Fenris Island and Silverpine, but did all of them escape? No. There are blight wagons everywhere. There are blight guns everywhere. There are goop goop things everywhere. Guaranteed, a lot of them. And again, people might say, "Well, South Shore was just two buildings in a house." No. Lore wise, story wise, South Shore was a massive. Was it was it was a was a small town, not massive, a small town with houses and farms and everything down there. It wasn't two houses and an inn. Lore-wise, South Shore would be a lot bigger, so the population would be a lot bigger, so the damage would be a lot bigger. And it's easy to assume that not all those civilians, not all the South Shore guards, uh, made it out alive without getting a face full of uh, uh, Face full of blight. Someone here, and thank you, Tiny Valkyrie, for pointing that out too. It was big enough for Lothar to flee to. Lothar brought the victims, the surviving people of Stormwind from the sacking of Stormwind in the first war, to South Shore. It wasn't a small. What you're gonna have hundreds of hundreds of civilians show up in a village that has two buildings and a hut? No. It, it, South Shore is big enough, and you can you can guarantee that civilians met a horrible fate that day when the when the forsaken blight wagon showed up um we also have the 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 hillsbrad fields when the when the forsaken just rampage through that and turn into the sludge fields you see f humans in the ground buried alive in the ground their heads above the dirt uh and you the player have the option to set them free or bash their head in with a shovel you see operation tables and horrible Frankenstein-like buildings around. You see ghouls and abominations being made in here. There are fucked up, ex I mean, fucked up experiments have always gone on in Undercity, in the Apothecarium. That was that one dark side of, of Undercity. You went in, you were like, oh my god, this is horrible. Only now, they've brought it everywhere, and, and suddenly South Shore, or not South Shore, Hillsbride has now become a hotspot for that sort of horrible, twisted experiments. Um, and people who've listened to my podcast or listened to me talking, you know I'm a fan of the Forsaken. You know I love the idea of good Forsaken. But remember, a lot of Forsaken aren't good. You know, when you turn and you are raised, you are filled with all sorts of emotions. That's why the Sira in Darkshore, the whole the whole Warden thing, it's why to me it doesn't not make sense. It makes perfect sense to me that Sira is now part of the Forsaken. You know, she died with such anger, th angry thoughts in there, such, such, such sorrowful and doubtful thoughts in her mind. Same with almost, you know, you're running from the Scourge and you trip and fall and ghouls rip you apart. The sheer terror going on in your mind before you block out be by being ripped apart you then open your eyes, you are a forsaken. That's the last thing you remember. Necromancy is going to twist that into pure, absolute anger. It's why the forsaken wanted vengeance against Arthas. When that was over, Sylvana said, well, where do we direct our anger now? This direction, South Shore, go. That's why so many forsaken are portrayed as fucked up individuals, cruel, mindless. That's why when you attack a uh, forsaken in Darkshore, all you hear is, you'll hear one of the forsaken rogues whisper, 
can you hear the screams? You're like, oh yeah, you're totally not evil. But before the storm shows us that not all Forsaken are like that. There are the other side as well, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, the horrible war crime committing parts of the Forsaken. That's also true. There was a tauren in a cage in Undercity in the Apothecarium. Um, and the Apothecaries were testing cures on them. And she was crying. What? She volunteered, but... She was crying. That That is messed up. Someone's gonna say, you know, Forsaken Defender of Savannah said, well, she volunteered. Ugh. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Western Lordaeron in uh, Cataclysm. The Druids and the Argents have cleansed much of the Plague Lands now. That's why I didn't call it the Plague Lands. We got a whole bunch of farmers and Lordaeron civilians returning to these fields. Unfortunately, it's close to Anderhal and it's close to the Horde side of Anderhal. So what do you do? Horde players go and you kill all those farmers and you, you blight is thrown and they are raised by the Valkyr there. Literally refugees returning to their home and nope, not on my watch. Butcher, slaughter, kill. Blight is dropped everywhere in, in Lord Run. And I think that it's... A lot of people kind of meme the Blight, but it's if you think about it for a moment... Uh, the Forsaken are absolutely messed up. And so many of them still have that evil scourge... Um, mentality of death to the living. It's literally a, literally a, um, one of the, uh, the war cries for the Forsaken. Let's talk about, let's, let's, we've bullied the Forsaken enough. Let's go back to bullying orcs. Siege of Orgrimmar. All right. Now I get it. The Corcoran were cruel, right? We we're shown that in Tides of War, we're, sh uh, Tides, yeah, Tides of War. Malkarok joins the Horde, which, why? One of uh, Ren Blackhand's Black Rocks, and he brings a whole bunch of Black Rocks with him, and they join the Corcoran. And this is where the Corcoran cruelty really started. When Malkarok joined, he was allowed to do some horrible things, which almost lead by example. Suddenly, the other Corcoran were thinking, "All right, we're, I guess we're allowed to do this now." I guess the Corcoran were the was the personal guard of the War Chief, but under Garrosh's regime, it became the police force of the War Chief. And suddenly, we went from seeing a couple of elite Corcoran guards following Thrall around and Garrosh around in some locations to Corcoran everywhere. Everyone was a Corcoran. It suddenly lost its, um, the special status. It became the elite police force of Orgrimmar. And they were cruel. We saw, the, the, and again, this was, these were storytelling devices to make us hate Garrosh. And unfortunately, and this is no insult to the game team or, or the narrative team, but I would have loved to see both sides of it. I would have loved to see more, you know, the proper use of morally gray. But instead, we only saw the blatant evil. We saw troll dark spears all lined up on their knees, hands behind their back, with Corcoran with rifles to the back of their heads. We saw dark spears who were led on a chain to in front of a proto drake who was then eaten by the proto drake outside of orgrimmar we watched prisoners of theramore come to that in a second fighting each other in orgrimmar uh, and then we saw other prisoners impaled to 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 walls and to into posts now the again this was a storytelling device background stuff for us to really hate garrosh's corcoran in Tides of War, the civilians escape from Theramore. People don't know where I'm going with this. The civilians escape on a boat to Theramore, they, and they go south before the blockade happens. Dave Kozak even said the civilians escaped, and it was a legitimate military target. Those civilians who stayed in Theramore chose to stay. They knew the Horde was coming. Suddenly, there's civilian Theramore civilians in Orgrimmar. Two years later, there's civilians uh, prisoners in Orgrimmar. And I honestly think it was an oversight. The level designer in Siege of Orgrimmar had not read Tides of War, knew that Garrosh's horde attacked Theramore, a boat left, no description, and that's it. And because it did kind of go against what Dave Kozak and other devs were saying, was it was a legitimate military target, the civilian, you know, there was no civilian deaths 
on a large account, Theramore was a giant military target filled with military commanders and the might of many different armies. The neutral Draenei commander from the Sh uh, Sunwell uh, campaign was there. General Marcus Jonathan, who guarded the gates of Stormwind for so many years, he went. All these people went. And when the Siege of Theramore didn't work out, when Caligo started dropping trees on the Horde, Gar Garrosh said, Alright, plan two, drop the bomb, boom. Took out all these Horde, uh, these Alliance generals, all these Alliance soldiers in one go. Was the bomb valid? Was the bomb honorable? No. But it was a military target. So, and the point was the civilians escaped, and then in Siege of Orgrimmar we saw a discrepancy. So I'm, I'm under the belief that they could have made Siege of Orgrimmar horrifyingly dark without the use of Theramore civilians. It was just, it, honestly, I think it was something that was a, an oversight because the fact that so many of the lead writers were like, no, no, the civilians escaped. That The whole point was Theramore was supposed to be a horrible attack, but not a horrible travesty, uh, devastating death of civilians. It was soldiers, which made you, know, made you argue, was it a legitimate military target or was it dishonorable? It was both. So seeing the Theramore civilians in Siege of Orgrimmar, I almost tend to not look at those because, not because, oh, it disrupts the idea that all oh, not all the Corcoran were bad. No, you, the Corcoran were still horrible in every other way. That just goes against multiple different devs. I honestly think that's just a, uh, just an oversight. But it was still there, so we can't exactly ignore it. Now, the other question I want to ask you is, were the Corcoran all bad? Nazgrim proves that they weren't. Now, was Nazgrim literally one orc among thousands who was the only sane orc who sided with Garrosh? No, definitely not. Um, the thing to remember is most of the orcs of the Horde sided with Garrosh. Someone's going to post a comment saying, actually, a community manager back in the day said most orcs didn't side with Garrosh. First of all, and no disrespect to the community manager, um, that is not true. Several writers confirm that the... You just think about it for a second. Why would most of the orcs not side with Garrosh? Who the hell did he have on his side when we attacked the city? Do you know how many orc trash mobs are in Siege of Orgrimmar? There's a lot. There's a lot. And there's green orcs, and there's Magar orcs. There's brown orcs, you know, his buddies from Outland. So most of the orcs did side with Garrosh. Most of the orcs were looking for that war hero. And when Garrosh came back from Northrend, Garrosh was a war hero. He he riled up that orcish pride. The, you know, the whole point of Tides of S the War, that random book that happens in Vanilla WoW, Tides of War, the Cycle of Hatred, something, whatever it is. Not Tides of War, Cycle of Hatred, I think it is. There's literally a bunch of orcs in there who are trying to wage war against the Alliance underneath Thrall's nose. And Thrall's like, no, we have to be good. The orcs wanted to fight the Alliance. The orcs were looking for a fight, and instead they were, you know, they were getting lazy in, in Durotar. Like, what are we doing? This is this is a shitty place. Why would we live in a desert? We can't even do anything. This sucks. So Garrosh comes around. Look, Torugar. Oh, yeah, this dude's awesome. Let's go beat up some people. And that sort of pride followed. Garrosh, you know, Thrall said, Garrosh, lead the horde like a true orc would. And he's like, yes, sir. The orcs were A-OK -okay with that. Now, some of the old orcs who knew history was repeating itself, like Sarfang, were like, mm, this is probably a bad idea. But these young orcs who grew up in internment camps, who heard stories of these heroes, heard stories of Grumash Hellscream and Kargath Bladefist and the, the glory days of the clan, they suddenly felt a little bit like, yeah, yeah, we're living, we're living our heroes' stories. Here we go. Most of the orcs sided with Garrosh. That, and there are going to be the rebel orcs who don't, but most did side with Garrosh. Look at the population in there. Does that mean they were all twisted and evil? No. How many of these Corcoran were, and, and again, this comes back down to real life history. You know, when the, when the Nazis say they were just following orders and people say that's not a valid reason. And it's it, it, back in that day, and I, I got into a conversation with a developer at BlizzCon about this, about why Bane's not doing anything to Sylvanas. What, what, what can he do? If, if Bane does something, she's going to lash out at his people. Her people, His people are going to end up in camps, tortured, blighted, whatever. So Bane has to go along with some of this for, for a certain amount of time. And there are people who will argue that, no, he, he could easily challenge her right now. But given how much support Sylvanas still has with her own people and how deadly Sylvanas is and how, willingness, how willingly capable she is of cheating... 
Bane following Sylvanas begrudgingly, it like just look at past regimes and look at and look at how before rebellions start, where the where does the descent start? Does the descent happen overnight or does it build? It's a building factor. I'm not saying Bane is doing nothing. I'm saying it's a building factor. Um, so back to the orcs. How many of these orcs are following orders? How many of these orcs are following their blood oath? Their blood oath swears them to their war chief, not to Garrosh, but to the mantle of war chief, which is Garrosh. They are an instrument of their weapon of their war chief's desire, weapons to be used by their war chief. Now they saw their path as a one direction path. Follow their war chief no matter the cause. Now you might say, well, they're blinded. They're clearly blinded by hate. Well, think about it though. If they're inside Orgrimmar, what sort of you know, we're talking about the horrors of war. Propaganda is one of those horrors. How many of them fell under the sway of propaganda? Think about it. Dark spears are traitors. You know, all they hear is Vol'jin betrayed the horde on Pandaria and was killed because of it. Dark spears started a, a, a rise up in the Dark Spear Isles. The Corcoran went to to control it. They fought back, slaughtered innocents in in Razor Hill. And you could argue how many. You know, the Corcoran who lived in Razor Hill or the orcs who lived in Razor Hill, how many of them were killed in the Corcoran Darkspears scuffle? Rumors make it back to Orgrimmar that the Darkspear came in and slaughtered everyone in, Dar in, in, in Razor Hill. No one's gonna t talk about the, the good aspects of it. Propaganda is focusing on trying to convince you about something. So the Darkspear come in and slaughter the innocents of Razor Hill. You're trapped inside, or and tra 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 inside Orgrimmar. The Torin have abandoned the Horde because they don't honor traditions. Karen Bloodhoof challenged Garrosh to Makora. Karen Bloodhoof died. And now the Torin are leaving the Horde because they don't like that? They are disrespecting Horde traditions. Again, not all the details are there. Uh, the Forsaken have used Blight everywhere, disrespected Garrosh, oh, disobeyed Garrosh, and the Blood Elves tried to rejoin the Alliance. Who else is left in this Horde? Orgrimmar is our city. Not theirs. So the, the the horde pick up the orcs pick up their axes and shields. The horde up there isn't the horde. They're rebels. They're usurpers. You know the the, the propaganda spreads. Suddenly these civilians, these soldiers, these grunts of the horde, they're hearing outside perspective or inside perspective without any sort of outside knowledge. Suddenly the rebels is easily painted in a, in a villainhood way. Suddenly, the Darkspear are monsters, and the Torn are dishonorable, and the Blood Elves are filthy traitors, and the Forsaken... Let's not even talk about them. Um, how many civilians inside Orgrimmar refused to leave? A, because the Corcoran were assholes and didn't let them leave, or B, B because they were afraid they'd get cut down by the Darkspear. And how many of those civilians got caught in the crosshairs? Now, this is where I come to the Alliance being aggressive. And this is, again, same with my remarks earlier about people running in and slaughtering Warsong children in Warlords of Draenor. None of this is confirmed to have happened, but if we look at this in a realistic setting, we look at the, the past events of real-life cities being sacked through history. Look at prime example in Game of Thrones. When Tywin Lannister and the Lannisters showed up um, with young Ned Stark, and they, and, and they asked the Mad King to open the gates, to be his ally, and the Lannisters walked in and, sl and suddenly started sacking the city. Do you think all the Lannister men in that army were just twisted, deranged, insane psychopaths? No, they were regular men. But suddenly, they start storming the city, war, bloodshed, cannon fire, everything is happening. Mortar, you know, explosions. Suddenly, the horrors of war take over, and the nature of, the nature of humans takes over, and humans become a monster in war cycle. You know, you hear... It, you know, Coma, this happens before the show even starts, you, you jerk. Sorry, someone in chat said spoilers for Game of Thrones. By the way, that's not spoilers for Game of Thrones. That happens in the prelude to the story, uh, for the record. So, real-life cities being sacked, horrible things happen from the hands of good people, people who might have just been farmers or regular soldiers, but suddenly in the in the horrors of war, and by no means am I justifying what the what the nature of man becomes in a blood. Thankfully, I've never been in that situation. And you know, you hear horror stories from real life of, of soldiers who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq about the things they had to do or, or things they witnessed and the sheer mental agony is there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch a scenario here. The Alliance 
years being pushed by Garrosh. Theramore is hot on everyone's mind. Anduin has just been kicked into a wall on Pandaria and had every bone in his body broken. The Vale bombed past wars. The Alliance is finally laying siege to a city. They are finally getting the revenge against the most cruel and monstrous aspect of the Horde, the Corcron, Garrosh. Because again, they only see it from their perspective. Without them, this siege won't happen. That's fact. Siege of Orgrimmar would not have happened without the Alliance. The Alliance allowed it to happen. Um, because Fulgen had like two siege weapons and they were made of wood. They storm the streets, horde rebels at their side. You've got trolls, you've got some orcs, you've got Torin, Forsaken, Goblins, three Pandaren, and they start clearing the districts. Corcoran are holding their ground in blockades while others are pulling back to the Underhold for the last final stand. Now think about how, and th again, I'm, I'm pitching a scenario here, alliance-based scenario, right? Um, think about how big Orgrimmar would be real life wise all the little back alleys and little back streets it's a huge city it's a massive gorge right so people are rushing through you know we the heroes we had a solid path right to Nazgrim down into the underhold does that mean the rest of the city was abandoned no and I actually think that the back gate would have been attacked by more night elf forces coming from Ashenvale so suddenly you have all these districts being attacked Civilians are huddled up in these buildings. Now we have Joe. In comes Joe, right? Joe... Joe was a teenager, a late teen, when Stormwind was sacked. He saw his father beheaded by an orc. Mother, crushed beneath flying mortar fire, fled the city. Joined up with the Grand Alliance, you know, started fight training to become a, a soldier. Became a squire or a page in the Second War. Saw horrible, horrible acts of war committed in the Second War. Watched and when Lothar skull get crushed by Orgrim Doomhammer. Spoilers for Warcraft 2. Joined, uh, you know, fought to become a, a, a soldier of the Alliance, fought in the Third War, fought in the Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, saw what the Horde did at the Wrathgate. Again, Alliance propaganda. In his head, the Horde is nothing but monsters. He has seen all of these horrible acts. He didn't play Warcraft 3, he didn't see Thrall being all good. All he saw was Grom and the Warsong butchering Night Elves in Kalimdor. He saw what happened at the Wrathgate. He saw what Garrosh does at Theramore. So now Joe's running through the streets. Joe runs into a district and sees an orc, charges that orc instantly, the orc charges him back, deflects the blow, slices off the orc's hand, beheads the orc on the spot. Only to realize that that orc is Mucklug the blacksmith, defending his shop with his family huddled in the shop. Joe didn't stop and think. Joe rushed in. Joe killed the first orc he saw. Now, Joe has seen some shit. Does Joe, does that make Joe a villain? You know, Joe, now, now what if, what if war, and I, I, I don't actually have a way for any, any soldiers or vets who are actually listening to this, and, and I don't understand how PTSD works because I've, I've never had, thankfully, never had to experience it, but from what I understand, you know, the, the PTSD, the, 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 the seeing red in that scenario, you know, Joe is fighting the blacksmith, out comes his wife, screaming in rage as, as her husband is trying to defend. She swings, Joe cuts her down. The children are now screaming and crying. Well, what's Joe's first reaction? You know, all he sees is red. He sees, you know, Mulrug, the, the, the leather worker, come running out with a spear. So Joe goes at him as well. So these are civilians who are defending against Joe the villain, Joe the evil alliance soldier. But Joe has years and years of hatred embedded into his head. Turns around and there's the dead leather worker, there's the dead blacksmith and his and his and his wife, and in his fury, he cut down the children as well. The children are now dead. Does that make Joe an absolute evil twisted lunatic monster? No. But that doesn't make Joe, you know, the alliance isn't all good either. Joe just committed a horrible act of act of war, a war crime. Now, was that the point of Siege of Orgrimmar? No, but you're rushing through the streets to clear, you're looking for the Corcoran, who are committing these horrible acts. Let's jump to the Horde side, alright? Darkspear are there on an- they are angry. Vol'jin is saying, we will- we will take back Orgrimmar. You know, the whole Horde- the Horde is family. Where did that come from, Vol'jin? That was never a thing. 
that was never a saying until you made it up. Either way, the horde is family. The the horde comes running in, but now you've got you've got I don't know, Zal June, the old grizzled. No, let's not make him old and grizzled. Let's make him young. Zol June, the young dark spear warrior. He saw his father tortured by Corcoran. Fingernails ripped up, uh, limbs torn off. Fing you can imagine the Corcoran ripped off, off troll limbs because they can regenerate. So you can imagine they laughed at him, broken off tusks. He saw his sister executed outside Orgrimmar. He saw maybe some trolls fed to Protodrake. So Zol June is angry. So Zol June runs in there, sees an orc. Doesn't know that it's Loctud, the, the the blacksmith. Throws his glaive, kills the blacksmith, turns around starts going around. He has seen the worst of the Corcoran, and he is just on a blood hunting path. That same troll, Zuljun, goes to Warlords of Draenor, storms into Blackrock Foundry, cuts through three Blackrock grunts, throws his glaive. Oh, there's two, there's two Blackrock civilians dead. But in his blood rage, he is remembering the worst of the orcs. Does that make him a villain? Does that make him a hero like us? No. These things happen, and while they don't happen on screen, if you if you want to imagine World of Warcraft and Azeroth at its absolute biggest height, as a realistic high fantasy, then these horrible acts of war from our own factions are going to happen. We have the heroes on our side, but we also have the villains. And an example that I thought of right before the podcast started was the Zandalari on the Island of Thunder. Many of these Zandalari listen to Zul's prophecy. Now we can laugh at Zul and say, haha, dude didn't make any prophecies. The dude made lots of prophecies. Um, and the one, that, the biggest one that was wrong was the catac that Zandalar was sinking. And that's actually Blizzard's way of retconning because in uh, Missa Pandaria, we knew that Zul saw uh, Zandalar cracked in half and sinking. But when Blizzard decided to put Zandalar as his own, they were like, oh, well, no, the, the it made a swamp and part of it got flooded, but we, we fixed it ourselves. But Zul said to Rastakhan, your home is sinking. You don't believe me. Cataclysm hit. Give me boats. Give me a fleet. Golden fleet was given to him. Many of the Zandalari civilians, soldiers, workers, packed up, hopped on the ship, and off they went. And Zul comes to Pandaria, knock knock on Leishen's door. Resurrect Zuljin, uh, Zuljin, uh, Leishen. Now you might wonder, why would the Zandalari, if they're so innocent, resurrect the, the Thunder King? Well, in Zandalari history, they don't have any good dealings with the Horden Alliance, with the exception of the vanilla Zulgrubs incident. But in history, they were best friends with the Mogu back then. So suddenly, Z Zul says, Rastakhan's a piece of garbage. Our home is think uh, sinking. We're gonna, we're gonna settle here. We're gonna wake up big, big bad man Leishen. And he's gonna he's gonna be happy with us. So they set up set up camp on the island of Thunder. You see Zandalari villages everywhere, and you literally see Zandalari workers, Zandalari peons, just just casual everyday fisher folk. And then we come running onto the land, you know, onto their new promised land, and decimate everything. You know, were there Zandalari children there? No, Jesse, the Zandalari child model didn't exist back then. Fine, but there was probably Zandalari children there. They're not there anymore. Uh, is what I'm trying to say. And the last example I have here is kind of a little bit iffy. And I talked with Shandrin about this. The Sacking of Undercity 1st Edition, back in, back in Wrath. Now, this is going to upset some people. Sylvanas fans, here's your warning. We know Sylvanas was aware of the attack on, on uh, the Wrathgate. We know Sylvanas was well aware of that. And for those of you saying that it was a retcon that Blizzard introduced it recently just to make her questionable, no, we the, the implication was in the writing there. And talking to certain developers who were involved in that writing, it's blatantly there. It's uh, the other example, it's right in the cinematic. Arthas looking, Sylvanas. Even though Sylvanas isn't on the hill, it, it totally adds up to something she would do. Now, what happened was we can assume that this attack was meant to happen, but Putris used this attack as an as an opportunity to strike a coup against her with Varamathras. So suddenly, all of these higher uh, 
beings up in up in the Undercity courts. Those most loyal to Sylvanas, they were probably executed or attacked right away. Sylvanas barely escapes. That's why she turns the whole thing. Oh, I didn't know about it. I, cause they turned on her. Had Petrus not turned on her, this light likely would have been where Sylvanas becomes a villain. But they all turned on her. So she escapes, goes to the only ally she has, Thrall, and says, they, they turned on me. Now the question to ask, and again, level design back then wasn't as detailed as it is now. So we, we can't 100% use what was in game, but let's try and make some assumptions here. How many civilians escaped the Undercity after the coup? Did Putras go on a mass execution of all the civilians in the city? I don't think so. I think Petrus was trying to was trying to to clear a future for the Forsaken, and he chose to ally with the with the Burning Legion, which you and I might say that's kind of dumb. But he was, you know, Sylvanas was not looking out for their best intentions. They wanted revenge, death to the living, death to the scourge, and death to the living, and Sylvanas wasn't doing that. So Petrus organized with with Ku. Um. That's a good point. Sylvanas made a super weapon that harms the undead too. Petrus can use it on Sylvanas. He now has power over her. She is not leaving the Forsaken how Petrus thinks she should. So I, I, and I'm not trying to glorify or call Petrus a hero in any way. Dude was clearly a villain. Did you see his outfit? Clearly a villain. But I don't think he went and slaughtered innocent civilians either. I think it actually might be similar to Suramar in which that the, the demons were occupying the city, but the civilians were kind of keeping to themselves, keeping their heads down, not looking. They were scared. They didn't want to leave. You know, you try to leave, the guards stop you. What do you say? You get killed because they think you're going to try, to try to escape, right? So the city was definitely occupied. Um, and I'm willing to believe that the city had a large amount of civilians. Now, Thrall, when Varian and Jaina come bursting through the sewers with a massive group of soldiers, they see horde soldiers already littering the place they see demon soldiers everywhere the horde is in there and the horde is trying to regain the city from putress's hands they are cutting down all putress loyalists which actually would have been hard because as a putress loyalist what are you going to wear like a t-shirt saying i heart putress no so you could hide in a group of civilians and you could escape that's why i you know i was always under the belief that there are probably a lot of putress loyalists out there who are probably still around because they could have just fallen in line fallen into the shadows fallen to the crowds of civilians oh no 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 don't harm me you know take off the plague take off the plague mask throw off the plague gun into the river into the the plague river no i'm good i love you sylvanas easy just to fall in right so the horde is trying to regain ground regain their city back the alliance comes in the siege is led by sylvanas and varian this is at the height of Varian's anger. Varian is pissed. Bolvar, his best friend, is dead because of this attack, because of the Forsaken, because of the Horde, because of the Scourge. He is dead. Again, Alliance propaganda. How many Alliance squads broke off, cutting through the streets, looking for Putras, and they came across a group of huddled Forsaken civilians who had no interest in siding with Putras? Do you think the Alliance went, Light be with you. Noble undead creatures, please have some apples, have some water. No, no, they were decimated. They and and saying that a human soldier with ease comes in and decimates an orc family, a little bit different. You need to have some background there. But when you look, when the the way the alliance looks at the at the Forsaken and how they view them, you know, you could say the alliance are racist. The Forsaken just dropped blight on 5,000 Alliance soldiers and 4,000 Horde soldiers. I think those are the numbers from Chronicle. Uh, people are like, oh, only 30 soldiers died. No, several thousand, four to 5,000 of each faction died at the Wrathgate. And in their minds, in the Alliance's minds right now, the Forsaken are to blame. So when they come across a Forsaken civilian, you think they're gonna say, well, hang on, let's, let's, let's stop and think here for a moment. No, done, move, shield bash of the face, execute, move on. Um, and we see Varian get to Putras, they cut down Putras, and then he says, Look around you guys! Look at look at this room! Look at how fucked up this room is! There are bodies hanging from the ceiling on meat hooks! And we're supposed to be fighting alongside these guys? We're supposed to believe that this was an accident? Fuck that. And then Varian and the troops run to Thrall. And Jaina's like, No, I can't let you do this. You know, old Jaina was boring. For the record. 
I, I won't let you do this, Varian. Shut up. They get to the throne room and Varian says, Var I just listened to the audio actually, Shandon sent me the video. Varian calls the horde trash. Like, actually, like a 12 year old on the internet, you trash. I was like, oh, all right. I'm surprised they didn't insult Thrall's mom at the same time. Uh, he is mad at the horde. Um, and the alliance and horde came to blows right there. Both forces fought in the throne room until Jaina pulled the enough aoe them all back and then teleported the Alliance to safety. Um, the war crimes the Alliance committed in there, and I'm not saying it's justified, but in in the nature of, of that sort of narrative, it makes sense that, that of course, they, they would do that. It's not justified, but it makes sense. And I lied. I said that was the last example. I lied. There's one more example that I don't have written here, so I'm totally going off the script here. But Suramar. Suramar is a hot topic. You know, I've always asked, why did the Nightborn join the, the Horde and not the Alliance? And the fair arguments are that, you know, the Nightborn allied with the with the Blood Elves because they saw much more kinship there, and the Night Elves kind of shunned them. Which is fair. So when you when the night when the when the rebellion and the attack on Suramar happened with Lysra and Taranda and Liadrin. How many of the Nightfallen, who had not been fully cleansed back to their Nightborn form, how many of them were angry at their own people? Their people shunned them. Their people kicked them out. Their people reject. And you know, from the Nightborn in the city's perspective, they had no choice. They were follow They were literally following the orders of the Legion. They were trying to um, not die. You know, that's valid. But from the outcast perspective, I was outcast with my family. I watched my wife my little daughter wither into mindless creatures. I don't care about your perspective. I'm going in. And I'm and and so they start cutting down nightborn guard after nightborn guard. But then they come to the they come to a district where the civilians are huddling and they're terrified because they see the nightfall and they see them as this horrifying creature of Oh, it's a nightfall, and it's it's a disgusting. Get it away. You know, the, the nightborn are very proud creatures, so seeing one of their own withered, not to a complete wither, but to a nightfallen, that is disgusting to them. And in your mind, you're thinking, you're really? You're disgusted by me? And my, my family is dead because you kicked us out and you're disgusted? Really? Rage takes over. How many innocents died in the Siege of Suramar? How many, how many, um, nightborn, uh, not nightborn, high elf, uh, not high elf, words are hard, highborn night elves came in and looked upon the Suramar people and were like, hmm. How many Suramar guards stood in civilian close quarters? You know, th and from the Suramar guards' perspective, these are invaders. These are intruders. These these Suramar guards are protecting the civilians. So they're holding a blockade in a street with a whole bunch of civilians, and in walk a whole bunch of highborn night elf mages, and they just they look at the the Suramar guards and they see all the civilians, and they conjure one big firestorm just to take out the entire alleyway. Because in their eyes, the Nightborn are enemies. The, the Nightborn were cowards. The Nightborn sided with the Legion. The Nightborn let their own people die. Fuck this alley. And suddenly those those Elisan loyalists in the front of the alleyway and all the innocents behind them. You know, we the hero, Tyronda, might not do that. Even though she's kind of salty, Tyronda, I don't think would have done that. Tyronda would have killed the two guards and then insulted the civilians and left. But some really salty, really salty night elves or or whatever could have look at, looked at that and went hmm you know what casualties happen whoops boom suddenly innocence dead and from their perspective you might think oh wow that mr salty night elf that's kind of dickish of you someone here in chat just pointed out the nightborn literally bubbled up when the world was ending 10,000 years ago, and left everyone else to die. Fuck you all, we're gonna make our own world with blackjack and hookers. They left the whole world to die. And joke's on them, the world didn't die. And these survivors are here saying, really? Really, you abandoned us in the middle of that war and we fought like a million wars since and you haven't done anything? And now you're scared in the streets? Fuck you. That rage comes back. That abandonment comes back. Um. They, uh, 
the people of Suramar were protecting their civilians, thinking they were right. The Horde and Alliance, they're the villains in that story. In their story. Not our story, in their story. And then in our story, the Nightfallen story. Also, the other part is, uh, Thalestra had the, re the, the wretches, the, uh, the Withered, as a, as, a, as a ground force. They're pretty much just zombies. So imagine she sets loose a bunch of Withered on, on, on a district that rips apart a whole bunch of Suramar guards. Then that group of Withered turns and they see a whole district of civilians. Are they conscious of mind to not attack them? No. That civilian, they're like, oh my god, this is like the Scourge 2.0. And they, they're they done. Or they fight back and cut down the Withered. It's not a... It's not a... Um, it's not a black and white situation. So how many innocents, Nightborn children, were cut down in the Siege of Suramar when we were trying to, uh, you know, save them? Also, let's go right to the villains. The Burning Legion, we see Tachondrius even say, like, like he laughs at the Nightborn and he mocks him. He goes, oh, we'll give them our gift later. How many of the of the demons in, in just in defending the city were just cleaving Nightborn in half to get to the, for, to, get to the Horde and the Alliance? Um, how many of them, the, the Legion, the Legion doesn't care. The Legion's the ultimate example of, yeah, I'm gonna choose to kill that innocent guy, that soldier, and then all those children and civilians. The, first, the Legion does not care. So there's, it's all on all sides. How many innocents died on all sides there? Um, and I could do a whole podcast, actually, no, I can't do a whole podcast. The Legion, the Legion's war crimes and the Scourge's war crimes. Imagine for a second the sheer scariness of the Scourge and Lordaeron and watching your family members get ripped apart and then they open their eyes and they are now- It's a zombie situation. That's why zombie situations are so horrifying. People love the zombie aesthetic and the zombie movies, but I know a lot of people who a genuine fear would be the zombie apocalypse because that is terrifying. Only zombie apocalypse, but now you've got flying gargoyles, uh, giant spiders, necromancers, abominations. It's Resident Evil all over. Um... That's pretty much it for the podcast, in terms of everything that's that I'm talking about. The war crimes are there, the horrible things are there, guys. These things happen um, right in front of us. And just because they're not shown in the game doesn't mean they don't happen. You know, and, and it always got to me when people, and I'm gonna, we're gonna, I start with the Iron Horde, we're gonna end with the Iron Horde. When people say, you know, we deserve revenge on Grom, are you kidding me? We don't deserve revenge on Grom. We got our revenge. Grom's punishment should be up to the people of Draenor. We came in and decimated the Iron Horde in grand gestures of just complete genocide. And I say that word in actuality. The Iron Horde committed genocide, no doubt about it. But we, we did too. Those Warsong villages, you think we selectively came in, killed all the soldiers, and left all the... All the orc women and the orc men and the orc children who weren't a threat alone okay you guys are good you guys continue on and meanwhile they get killed by wolves because there's no one to defend them no oh hi mall we saw hi mall in the short story was an active city of of men women and children there the war song attack the iron horde attack hi mall in the in the prelude story um and that's why uh, High Imperator joins the Iron Horde is because the, the War Song and the Iron Horde lay siege to High Maul and start slaughtering everyone. Fortunately, the attack stops because the Imperator caves and he joins. Um, second biggest cave in history. And, uh, not going there. And then we attack and we go in. Do you think we're just going to leave those little ogre babies alone? I don't know what an ogre baby looks like, but is it are they the same size as regular? I don't know. But if we walk in and we attack a city of ogres, you know, we, we think that ogres are just this mindless villain race, but they've got workers and they have construction workers and they've got uh, craftsmen and they've got people with hope, aspiring hopes and dreams. Little children who want to grow up to be gladiators to so they could be just like dad. And then the Alliance and Horde come in and flatten everything. Also Cho'Gall. Cho'Gall shows up with all his horrifying creepy orcs. They probably ripped, a, ripped apart innocents left, right, and center. The the siege of any sort of raid, if it's got a... If it's not an immortalist faction, so if it's not like 
like the Siege of Emerald Nightmare, a little bit different, right? The 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 Siege of Tomb of Sargeras, you know, mostly enemies in there, but Suramar, Highmall, Blackrock Foundry had innocents of all kinds, and although they weren't in the game, lore-wise, they were there, and lore-wise, they probably were cut down by the by the angry Alliance vets and the angry Horde vets. Um, and again, do I think all of this needs to be shown in game? No, but people shouldn't dismiss it either. I don't think it's I don't think it's worth just shoving aside. Nope. If I don't see it, it doesn't happen. And if you want to create, do that in your own kind of creative, you have your bubble of World of Warcraft as this per perfect high fantasy where war crimes don't happen. That's fine. You're allowed that. That's your own narrative. But if you're going to accept Warcraft and World of Warcraft and Azeroth as a high, as a society, as a world that functions much like our own, with with just the farmers and the peons and the peasants and the women and children and men who are just, you know, having a little family time, the little smaller slices of life of Azeroth, then the horrifying aspects also happen. Um, and I thought it was an interesting podcast to go over all the what-ifs. To those of you who stayed and listened and were upset by a lot of the, the, the horrible topics, um, I did warn you. Um, do I ever think Blizzard will show more of this? In short stories and novels, yes. In the game, I doubt it. Um, kind of begs the question, if they ever made a War Warcraft Netflix series, right? Do you guys think... It, what the rating, what would the rating be? And I'm instantly... Instantly reminded... Just now, of the Warcraft movie. End of the movie! Civilians are running towards the Dark Portal, and the Dark Portal, um, the, the, the portal... Uh, Cadgar opens a portal to Stormwind. Maybe it's Medivh. Everyone's running through. Grom is standing there looking confused. And then the portal collapses. And then the wave comes down. And there was a bunch of humans who were about to run through when the portal just stopped. And on the other side of the archway is Grom, Kargath, and someone else. And they're just standing there, axes in hand. And then you see them swing, and that's it. They just cut down, like, four farmers right there, right? The, the brutality we see in the Warcraft movie is there, it just happens off screen. We see, you know, we see an orc holding a soldier's head in a helmet. Helmet goes off screen and you hear the crunch and you're like, oh, that was a watermelon, that didn't work well. Um, so do you guys think if a Warcraft Netflix series ever came out, what, the, what, the, what would the rating be to be realistic? And I don't mean realistic in terms of like historical accuracy. I mean realistic to do well. How could they make a Warcraft Netflix series that would legitimately do well with as much realism and darkness as possible? Game of Thrones is does so well. Do you think Warcraft could survive that? That's my question to you end in this podcast. If either you guys are commenting on Twitch, listening elsewhere, or on YouTube, um... SoundCloud, that's what I was looking for. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you what you, what you think should be shown um, and what kind of rating it could be and what they can get away with without actually showing everything because topics of genocide and, and child slaughter and everything, it happens, unfortunately. But does it need to be shown? That's all I got for you guys today. Thank you for listening to episode 36. Again, if you guys are interested in uh, the gnome event we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. Stay tuned. Look on social media and in the Discord. Discord links in the in the description below. Um, and that's all I got for you guys. We'll be back next week uh, with a new topic, episode thirty-seven. Probably push back a little bit so there's a little bit more time between the podcast uh, to reset. And again, go listen to my analysis on the two new uh, cinematics. And uh, with that, thank you guys, and we'll see you next time for episode thirty-seven, which I haven't decided what the topic is. Thanks, guys.